Amen. Good morning. So we are on the study of the book of Samuel, and we are doing the, the book uh, seven. Uh, we are doing one Samuel, and last time, as Tanga shared the word, do you remember what he shared on, or rather, till which verse he shared on? Chapter four was. Tanga, you covered all verses. All right. So I'm going to do a quick recap of those verses, and I'm trying to be going to be very optimistic uh, in what I'm going to share. And I pray the Lord would help me and help you to receive what is there. All right. So uh, I, if you, yeah, if you just, uh, I'll just put it. Up. There are three dots after t- after twelve, which means I'm going to continue from there, and I don't know where I'm going to end. All right, so I'm going to try and make sure that we at least cover the aspect of the capture of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and we take it through till the Ark is returned back. All right, so it uh, basically I'm able to close on that portion of Scripture, so we get an end-to-end picture of what's really happening there. And yes. Uh, even as we move with the, before we move ahead, I just want to call out some aspects of the Ark of the Covenant. And I put the points here. So, uh, but I'll just talk about it and just tell you what's, what's happening in this year, uh, the picture here. Right now, now the, the Israelites, so as to say, really were misusing or really not really thinking right when they took the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield. All right. Uh, When they took it, they assumed too many things in mind. Now, they thought it would help them win the war, but it did not. In fact, the Ark got captured. And what's sad is, as Tanga shared, is they did not even have a heart of repentance. They knew that their spiritual state was really down and out. The priests themselves were offering defiled sacrifices and forcing others to do the same. The priests themselves were sleeping with the woman at the gate. And things like that. So, I mean, in the midst of all that, they should not even have thought about doing something like taking the Ark of the Covenant in the battlefield. Because they themselves were not right before God. And it was a very terrible time. And uh, a lot of things were happening in, in their own lives. So as to, so that, to say that they were not straight before God. They were not right before God. Then what, what could they expect God to do in the midst of that war? Right? Neither was it commanded specifically by God that you can take the ark every time you go for war. It was not a specific commandment. All right. So it was some things that they were assuming. Uh, 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 you know, Eli himself, the priest, had just received judgment from God, just received a warning from God that because of all that you have done and because you have ignored the way your sons have, are living and offering sacrifices as priests before me, I am going to bring judgment upon you and your family. Alright. And Eli was alive while this, this all thing was happening. And it was, he did not do anything about that. Right. There was no repentance involved so as to say on the side of the people before they even thought of going to, go, going to war with the Philistines with the ark. There was no aspect of reverence or inquiring before the Lord. They did not ask they didn't have it in the letter go to inquire of the Lord. Lord, should we go for battle? Should we take the ark along with us for battle? There was just an assumption that they were going along with. Now what was the ark all about? We, 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 see, we see in the movies and we see a see, scene see about how, uh, you, you know, what is, uh, what is that movie? The famous one? Indiana, Indiana Jones. Right? We see that they are trying to, uh, the Germans are trying to capture the Ark and all that. They, if you, they believe that if they take the Ark again uh, to wherever they go, they will have victory everywhere. So they have all these images. As children, uh, most of us have seen those movies and we have had some kind of images and then we would have read the Bible and then probably had some corrections uh, was what we assume. But we, you know, there's a very strange uh, thoughts, some, some strange things that are there in our mind that we have some misconceptions about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, as I was studying about the Ark, I was trying to understand what 
really happened when the ark was with the people what did it signify what did it really stand for what were the israelites claiming to have in their midst was the ark god himself or was it something else and and as i was as i was studying the scripture and as i as i i came to i i basically was just trying to read i realized the ark was basically the covenant it that's why it was called the ark of the covenant we always remember the ark or rather sometimes we have a picture that the lord would come over the in between the cherubim and speak to moses so we our thought would be the ark was built for that so the lord would come there and make his presence known right that's one picture of it that's not the complete picture of the ark the ark as such was was a container so as to say which contained the covenant that god had with his people it was the promise of god that he had with his people this was god saying this is my covenant with you and i am placing my covenant with you in this ark in this box which is covered with gold and all those things but this, this is my covenant this is my treasure this is my agreement and what he was saying is in the most holy place that you are going to keep there the ark of the covenant where i would come and meet with uh, with, with the high priest or meet with moses he saying that everything is based on the covenant which is there in the most holy place i am placing my promise with you in the most holy place in the ark of the covenant in the ark so it is not just god coming and meeting it had something more of significance you see when the ark was kept there what god was saying is when i come and meet with you as well or speak to you and between talk the between the cherubim he saying what is below me what is the basis of my meeting with you what is the basis of my talking with you my covenant my covenant that i have with your fathers the covenant that i established with abraham isaac jacob the covenant which i reminded moses which are the law the the, the the laws that i'm given given to moses which are based on this covenant that you are my chosen people and i am to be your god and there is to be no one else and that is the picture of the ark of the covenant and god's presence coming over the ark signifying that if god is in our midst he is to be our only god and he's saying look if i am to appear before you if i am to come before you if i am to be your god then everything that is in this covenant everything that is in the ark here is applicable to you the basis of my meeting with you the basis of my talking to you the basis of you welcoming of me welcoming you into this family into this kingdom into being the chosen people the chosen generation is this covenant and this covenant is holy this covenant is precious this covenant is sacred to me and that is why i place it in the most holy place are you with me so when god chooses to talk to his people he just doesn't come and talk just like he's saying there's a basis on which i'm speaking to you and that is the agreement that i have with your forefathers that you i am to be your god and there is to be no other and you are to be my people and the basis of you being my people is these ten commandments which are in the ark of the covenant you prove to be my people when you fulfill these ten commandments starting with i am the lord your god who delivered you out of the land of slavery there shall be no other god before me there shall be no idols that you worship there should be no images that you worship you see god when he was to be considered to be in the most holy place where the ark of the covenant was he was he was basically communicating to his children to his chosen people 
that when I come, my covenant comes, I come because of my covenant that I have with you. I come because I am seated above my covenant. This covenant that is there between you and me is my throne. And as we obey that covenant, as we obey the commandments of God, we see His blessings. And when we disobey the commandments of God, we see the curses come down. Because God is holy. And He will not tolerate sin. And if you are His children, He will not tolerate sin all the more. And when people obey and see the blessings, they praise God and they glorify God and they thank God. And that's why when we see you are enthroned on the praises of your people. You see those praises are coming, becoming to going to Him because of this covenant that He has established with us. It, everything comes down to this covenant that is there in the Ark of the Covenant. That is there in the Ark. That is the basis and condition of God meeting with us. Or God talking with us. Or God blessing us. Or God correcting us. You see Moses knew these, his people very well. In Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 9 onwards it says. Therefore keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all you do. You are standing today all of you before the Lord your God. The head of your heads of your tribes. You open the scripture, Judge you Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 9 onwards. You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourner who is in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water. So that you may enter into the sworn covenant, the Lord your God, of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today, that He may establish you today as His people, and that He may be your God, as He promised you, as He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. <coughs> it is not with you alone that I am making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today. Before the Lord our God. And with whoever is not here with us today. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting the last words? And whoever is not here with us today. Who is he talking about? Us. The Gentiles. Those who will come. Into a covenant with God. And Moses is telling and reminding his people. Look. This is the covenant that the Lord has established with you. That he is our God and we are his chosen people. And he also gives a warning. Because Moses saw it coming. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Verse 24 onwards it says. When Moses had finished writing the words of this law. In a book to the very end. Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant. Take this book of the law and put it at the, uh, by, by, the side of the, uh, by, by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. That it may be there for a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. Behold, even today while I am yet alive with you, you have a rebellious, uh, uh, you, are rebel you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes. And your officers that I may speak these words in their ears. And call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly. And turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. And in the days to come evil will befall you. But because you will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. You see Moses saw it coming. He's saying, while I am alive, you all are doing all this. 
After I am dead, what will you do? And you see the state of Israel at that point when, uh, when the ark was gone. They didn't really care about God. They were living an evil life. They were living a rebellious life. And Moses saying this, this book of the law that is kept in the, beside the ark or in the ark, it's going, it's going to poke you. It's going to be a stand, it's going to stand as evidence against whatever I have spoken to you because I know you will go the opposite way. And before these verses, he actually asked that every once in every seven years, please take this book and read before everyone to remind everyone what I have spoken. You see this ark, the covenant was the representation of the throne of God in Israel. It was to say that God stands on his word. God is seated on his word. His covenant. His promise. And his word is in the most holy place. Sacred. Signifying to his people that his word is to be considered with reverence. And honor. The people need to remember this covenant that God has, with, uh, has made with them. And to keep their side of the covenant. A covenant is two-sided. There are two pot parties involved. And God says, I am keeping my side. And my side means I am keeping my word in the most holy place. And upon my word I shall deal with you. And it's the most holy thing to me. So it is with me. It is me. And he says, now you keep your side of the covenant. Because I, I'm not going to come out of the whole, most holy place. It's always going to be there. Sacred to me. Is it sacred to you? I am serious about my covenant with you, says the Lord. But are you serious about your covenant with me? You see, the ark went into battle before. Tanga called it up. The ark went in front of the marchers around Jericho. Moses told the priest to lead the ark into the battle against the Midianites. Saul brought the ark into battle, and so did David. And they assumed that since they did all these things, we can do the same thing. But in those cases, God instructed them. In this case, they decided to do it without any instruction. In this case, God was not with them. The elders wanted to take this representation of the covenant and throne of God out of the most holy place. Cover it and bring it to the battle with them. They hoped that they would give, would give confidence that God is with them. They were wrong. You see, Elysian says this, they believe the presence of the ark would make God work for them. Their idea was that God should be forced to fight for them. If he was not willing to do it for their sake, he would have to do it for his honor, his own honor's sake. <laughs> so their thought is, if not for us, he has to do keep to keep to make sure he keeps his name honored. He will do it because of that. Because now the ark is there. If it fails, God's name is going to go down. So he will do anyways. Let's take it along with us. A false expectation. A false expectation. They regarded the ark to be like a good luck charm for them. It's almost they treated the ark like the Aladdin's lamb. Let me rub it and God will come out and say, What do you, kya, kya hukum hai mere aka? What is your command? Your wish is my command. I will fulfill it. So let's rub the ark and let God come out and suddenly tell, Oh, yeah. What do you want? I will fulfill your wish. But God was no Aladdin. God was no genie. God was nobody to just be rubbed upon and come and come and fulfill your wishes. He was not like that.
Maybe it should be the other way around. If God rubs on us, we have to say yes. Kya hukum hai mera? What's your wish, Master? We were here to fulfill it. But the people here were trying the opposite. You see, when you read 1 Samuel Samuel chapter 4 verse 2, it it has some amazing words in it. It says, the Philistines drew up in, in line against Israel. And when the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines. Who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the troops came to the camp, the Israel said, the, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Now the first part of the statement is, who are they putting the blame on? The Lord. It was very clear to them, God was not with them. That's why they lost the battle. So now they are looking at the person of God and they think, why has the Lord allowed us to get defeated? And what's the next statement? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh that it may come among us and save us from the power of the enemy. Now from a person, they move their attention to the object. Saying, God is not going to do it like this. Let's twist his arm and make him do it in another way. It's not for us, for his name's sake. He will save us. Most of us do that, don't we? When we know it's not Lord's will, when we know we are living in sin, when we know we are doing something wrong. Not for my sake, Lord. For for your sake. For your honor and glory. Do it for your sake, Lord. What will people around you uh, around me say about you if, I, if they look at me like this we pass on the buck to God your responsibility not mine instead of trusting in the ark they should have been more concerned about how their state of worship was about how their state of service was towards God they themselves were not right before God. The priests themselves, Eli's sons, Hopi and Phineas were not right before God. They were the ones sleeping with the women at the gate. They were but the ones who were taking the best of, best of the offerings and eating it themselves. And now these two priests are going into battle. Vidya. Assuming that God is going to be with them. No mention is meant of Eli, what his take was on it. But he was probably sitting on his chair, fearing, scared. How can I say anything? And verse 10 onwards says, So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. And they fled every man to his home. And there was very great slaughter. And there fell of of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phineas died. Chapter 4 A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt over his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on a seat by the road watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. Then Eli heard the sound of the outcry. He said, what is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were, so, were set so that he could not see. I don't know what he was watching when he could not see. But he was really desperate. He was really desperate because he had allowed something to happen and he didn't know what's going to happen. So he was just waiting for the news. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. And there has has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas are dead. And the ark of the God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat from the side of the, uh, by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died. For the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant. 
about to give birth and when she heard the news that the ark of god was captured and that her father in law and her husband were dead she bowed and gave birth for a pain scared great her pains came upon her and about the time of her death the woman attending her said to her do not be afraid for you have born a son but she did not answer or pay attention she named the child ikabod saying the glory of has departed from israel because of the ark of god has been captured had been captured and because of a father in law and a husband and she said the glory of god has departed from israel for the ark of god has been captured you see the fact that the man coming with his clothes stone and dirt on him himself was already a sign that they would have seen from far away this man is not coming with good news when someone tore their clothes and put ashes on their head or face or dirt it signified mourning they were here somebody was mourning when this man was running mourning and people at the standing at the gate at the city shilo was seeing this man and said oh this guy is not coming with good news something bad has happened and then he comes and he he announces and people there's an outcry and eli is hearing and he's waiting oh what what, what is going to happen what is going to happen i know i should have I probably should have never let the ark go. I should have not let my sons go because God has already told me sons are going to die. Why did I allow them to go? And then he hears the news, and his response is not towards his sons. Oh, my sons have died. He didn't fall back when he heard that his sons are dead. He fell back when he heard the ark of God was captured. he knew he messed up he messed up as an elder as a priest as a judge in israel he messed up you see he never had the guts to tell his sons to stop sinning as priest and he never had the guts to prevent his sons and israel taking the ark into the battle he never had the guts he kept quite probably he or he allowed them go take it into the battle probably you will win and now the ark is gone and what is this priest going to do his sons are gone the dark is gone he just falls down and he says he was fat he was heavy his neck broke and he died god had held him responsible he had already told him though god did not tell him you will die he told your family is gone your generations are gone your blessing is gone your priesthood is gone and at least with those warnings he should have thought should i allow this to happen but he did not and now he was seeing the fulfillment of the judgment upon him and his family his sons were gone the ark is gone his priesthood is gone now he is gone he is gone And what about Phineas' wife? Just imagine her. We do not know how much she was involved in talking to her husband. He was sleeping with other women, so I do not know what she must be feeling about him. Probably she thinks he's a hypocrite. He is my husband, but he is sleeping with the woman at the gate. So her first thoughts would have, he has been a husband, but then she was more concerned. She ends. with the most important concern she ends with the most important concern she says the glory has departed from israel for the ark of god has been captured and for a woman who's just delivered a son an heir so as to say first born son for someone who has just delivered a baby in sort of happiness in sort of joy it is mourning and sadness so much so that she calls her baby 
ni Kabod. The glory of God has departed. Imagine this child living with that name throughout his life. Hey, the glory of God has departed. Come here. It was a reminder to his family, to himself, forever. You cannot fool around with God and assume that He's going to be on your side. God is holy. God is holy. Yes, the glory of God had departed from Israel in one aspect. The Ark of Covenant was taken away from the presence of the Israelites. That which they treasured, that which covenant which was there with him now was not there so as to say in their midst. That which they treasured is now not there. That upon which God's glory would come upon is not there. They knew they were in trouble. They knew it. Alison says this, the glory of God had departed in one sense. But the glory of God left when Israel stopped repenting and trusting God and started superstitiously trusting in the ark itself. The glory of God had indeed departed, but not because the ark of God had been captured. The ark of God had been captured because the glory of God had departed. It was the other way around. The glory of God had already gone away. When they chose to live the way their lives, they wanted to live sinfully. The glory of God had already gone away in one sense and because of that the ark of, ark of God had gone away. It was not the other way around. You see, when you look at the flow, a sequence, when the glory of God was present and when the glory of God actually departed, the priests and the congregation were, first of all, it all started with them, the priests and the congregation themselves drifting away from God, drifting away from loving God and to, to loving sin. The problem started with love, to what they were treasuring. That resulted in the lack of reverence and worship to God. That again resulted in false worship. Now when there is lack of reverence and worship. Now when you come on a Sunday morning. You don't know God. You don't know what you are singing. You don't know what you are praying about. You don't know what you are just going with the flow. And you just start singing songs without any understanding what you are singing. So it's, it's a false worship. It's a made up worship. It's a false reverence. It's, it's an emotional experience that we go through. And they were doing that. Now that they are not revering God, not worshipping God in the true sense, now they have started worshipping God in the false sense. Just to show, uh, we are there. We are there before you. We are coming to the temple. We are showing our face. And then that results in self-worship. Eventually you are just coming to please yourself. To ease your guilt. To ease your conscience. It has been commanded. I don't feel anything but let's just let me go there. So at least I have done my job. Sunday I have gone to church. That's enough for me. At least I have shown my face to God. He remembers I am come. So he will bless me. What I do, obey or not, is a different story. Grace of God is sufficient for me. So I will do what I want. But show my face on a Sunday. That's enough. And until then, God is, from His side, is going on warning us. Going on telling us, come back to me. Come back to me. There's time, come back to me. Repent, turn. Come back to me. But then when there is continual rebellion and defiance towards God, 
That's when we stop even listening to the warnings of God. We stop listening to our conscience. And then that results in us being really away from God. That's when the glory of God departs from us so as to say, though He is there all around us, but now we cannot communicate with Him anymore because we have lost Him. He has not lost us. We have lost Him. We chose to abandon Him. Because we want to live our way. We want to worship ourselves. We want to serve ourselves. We want to please ourselves. And God is nowhere in the picture. He is just a sign of the cross. But there is nothing about that cross in our lives. Where do we stand with the presence of God today in our lives? 1 Samuel chapter 5 When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they bought it from Ebenezer to Astrid. And, and uh, then the Philistines took the ark of God and bought it in the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Dagon was their God. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. Alright. When they rose early on the... uh, when they, but when they rose early next, uh, early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head out of Dagon, and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to them. That is why the priest of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and He terrified and afflicted them with tumors. Both Asdod and its territory. And when the men of Asdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of God, of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of, the, of, ark of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they bought the ark of God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out from them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the, the ark of God uh, of Israel, the uh, ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought it to, uh, around to us the ark of God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered, gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of God to Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. The Philistines thought they, were, they had a great treasure that they had captured. There was a lot of gold. But somewhere they also knew that this is the Ark of the Covenant which needs some kind of reverence. They did not take it and put it in their storeroom. They took it and put it in their temple. They put it in the temple. Beside their God. Dagon. You see, this God Dagon was Aquaman. Why I say Aquaman, mermaid or merman, whatever you want to call it. His, his base down was a fish and then from top it was man and he had a, he had a high hood on his head. So they worshipped this god, he was a god of fertility. Alright, and uh, so now they had his image or they had his idol in, in the house of Dagon, in, the, in, the, in their temple. And uh, so they had this brilliant idea that we will take the ark and place it beside so that we get a double blessing. Let both the gods enjoy together, spend time together, talk to each other, they'll have fun. We'll come in the morning and worship him. And they come in, in the morning, said, Hey, Apna, Bhagwan to Girgari. I got filled up, probably something happened. Let's lift it and let him and keep, keep him back. They didn't probably, they did not realize that he was fallen, that idol was fallen face down in a posture of worship towards the ark. But they lifted and they put it back. And they continue the worship and the next day morning they come and they say this time the ark had, had again fallen down. Now this time his head is broken 
The hands are broken. Now with the head broken, still the head is falling, rolling and reverence to the Ark of the Lord. And they realize this is not a place for the Ark of the Covenant. He has harmed our God. Dagon cannot stand before the God of Israel. He is very weak. The God of Israel has broken up his head and his hands. He cannot remain here. And then God struck the city. They were, they were struck with tumors. And uh, it says, because later on when we read chapter 6, it talks about mice as well. They build some images of mice. But what it says is, there was some kind of epidemic which had come into play. And there were mice which were there. And there were tumors on the, uh, on the uh, body of the people. And they were suffering, the big time. Big time suffering. There was, they were really were struggling a lot. Alright. And uh, the God had caused this to come upon them. You see, just one chapter back, when they realized that there was a shouting in the camp of Israel, what was the response of the Philistines? When they heard shouting, when they heard Israel had bought something into the camp, there were great shouting and rejoicing in the camp, because actually Israel had bought the Ark of them. What was the response of the Philistines? They were scared. What is their response? Again, what else did they say? God has come into the camp. What else? Go to us. What else? What did they remember about this God of Israel? Louder. What God had done in Egypt with the Egyptians? The plagues. They knew that this God had a reputation to do this to their to his enemies, and they had they risked taking the ark of the covenant of God into their temple. What were they thinking? They already had a revelation. This God will cause, as one who has caused plagues in, in Egypt, he's a very dangerous God. But then they built courage on them. No, no, we'll fight. And they fight the fought they won. Not because they had strength, because God allowed them. And now God is here, so as to say, alone without the Israelites, the Ark of the Covenant is there, and he causes panic in the camp of Philistines. And now they feel it. We should have thought about the, epidemic, the plagues that Israel, Egypt had. Now a similar kind of plague is coming to us of tumors and mice. And so they say, let's move the ark to another city. So they move the ark of, the, of God to, to uh, if you move it to the next one. Next slide. Okay, I'll move it. So, so, so this is just showing the journey of the ark. Uh, from where all it went on a seven month ride when it was with the, with the Philistines but uh, so they moved the ark to Gath alright now when they are in Gath God does the same thing causes panic in the city tumors there as well mice are coming out and stuff like that so there, there's a problem there so they say we don't want this ark move it so now they <laughs> they move it to uh, Akron. Alright. Now it is come to Akron. The people of Akron, first of all, have two cities are already in trouble and you are bringing it to us. We don't want the ark. But somehow they still delayed. They were still, it was still there for quite some time or maybe minimum time. But they got, gathered the lords of the Philistines together. There were five lords, five cities, so five lords. And they came to they came there and they had a meeting. And by, by the time they had the meeting, already people were dying. There was a deadly situation there, people were dying and they are saying those who did not die got tumors. So now they were in desperate state to just get rid of the Ark of the Covenant. All right. And interestingly with Ekran it says that for them the hand of the Lord was very heavy. It started with the hand of the Lord being heavy with uh, as that from there the hand of God was against in uh, Gath, but now when they come to Ekron, it says the hand of the Lord was heavy, very heavy upon them. So, I, almost signifying like the Lord was saying, You better act fast before I finish you off completely. And so now they say, we, we have to figure out a way how to get rid of this ark. We can't keep it here. 
all right he has dealt with our god dagon is gone for a toss there's no scope of dagon he can't swim out of it with this uh, uh, with this uh, uh, fish tail so he he is gone so now we need to basically think of what we can do just need need to return back the ark all right the people also are suffering and now we get into chapter 6 i hope i'm doing well at time uh, it says can someone read it out please chapter 6 the whole chapter and chapter 7 verse 1 and 2 as well somebody take the mic and just read it god of the ark of the lord was in the country of the philistines seven months and the philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said what shall we do with the ark of the lord tell us with what we shall send it to its place they said if you send away the ark of the god of israel do not send it empty but by all means return him a guilt offering then you will be hailed and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you and they said what is the guilt offering that we shall return to him they answered five golden tumors and five golden mice according to the number of the lords of the philistines for the same plague was on all of you and on your lords so you must make images of your tumors and images of your mice that ravage the land and give glory to god of israel perhaps he will lighten his hands from off you and your gods and your land why should you harden your hearts as the egyptians and pharaoh hardened their hearts after he had dealt severely with them did they not send the people away and they departed now then take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there was never come a yoke and yoke the cows to the cart but take their cows home away from them and take the ark of the lord and place it on the cart and put it in the box at its side the figures of gold which you are returning to him as a guilt offering then send it off and let it go its way and watch if it goes up on the way to its own land to beth shemesh then it is he who has done us this great harm but if not then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us it happened to us by coincidence the men did so and took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and set up their cows at home and they put the ark of the lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the images of their tumors and the cows went straight in the direct direction of bethshemesh along one highway lowing as they went they turned neither to the right nor to the left and the lords of the philistines went after them as far as the border of bethshemesh now the people of bethshemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley and when they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark they rejoiced to see it the cart came into the field of joshua of bethshemesh and stopped there a great stone was there and they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the lord and the levites took down the ark of the lord and the box that was beside it it in which were the golden figures and set them upon the great, great stone and the men of bethshemesh offered one offerings and sacrifices sacrifice sacrifices on the day of day to the lord and when the five lords of the christian side they returned that day to ekron these are the golden tumors that the philistines returned as a guilt offering to the lord one for astod one for gaza one for ashkelon one for geth and one for ekron and the golden mice according to the number of all the cities of the philistines belonged to the five lords both forfeited cities and unwalled villages the great stone beside which they set down the ark of the lord is a witness to this day in the field of joshua of bethshemesh and he struck some of the men of he struck some of the men of bethshemesh because they looked upon the ark of the lord he struck 70 men of them and the people mourned because the lord has struck the people with a great blow then the men of bethshemesh said who is able to stand before the lord this holy god and to whom shall he go up away from us so they sent messengers to inhabitants of kiriat jerim jerim saying the philistines have written the ark of the lord come down and take it up to you 
and the men of the Kiriath Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eliezer to have charge of the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark was lodged at Kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, some twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Interesting sequence of events of how the ark was returned back and the response of Israel, what happened to the people at Beth Shemesh and where the ark landed and was for another 20 years. You see, this is where initially the ark was, uh, the battlefield was taken from here and then obviously they got it from Shiloh, they got it from to the battlefield, from here it was captured, taken to Asdod, from Asdod it was taken to Gath, from Gath to Ekron and then to Beth Shemesh. So while it was still from year to year, it was there for seven months and this area saw all the uh, tumors and the death and the epidemics or uh, plagues, whatever got uh, brought upon them. And then finally from here, Beth Shemesh, it is where it was taken to Kiryat Jerim, where it remained for 20 years and then finally under David's rule, it was moved to Jerusalem. Alright, now this is a picture of, the actual picture of Beth Shemesh, the street where the ark would have been written back. Alright, so nothing has changed there. The road there is pretty much what the road was at that time as well. So you see this white strip here is basically the is the highway or the road through which the cart uh, with the bulls would have arrived or the cows would have arrived. And this is the area of Beth Shemesh. There are hills on either sides and this is where uh, the ark would have arrived. And you can see there's a lot of green pastures around. Alright, so now seven months was a long time for the ark to remain there while the Philistines are learning their lesson I wonder whether Israel learned their lesson it seems to me that Israel did not learn their lesson Israel was not pursuing the ark they did not go and fight back to get the ark but they seem to have just resigned to a position saying the Philistines already have given us a bad time. Let's relax now. We don't have time to get God back in our midst. Let's accept the defeat and just live in our sin. So the Philistines came with a, with a very interesting idea. To challenge God. Or rather to see whether if this God is really true. Then whatever we plan in the way of, of returning the ark. It should happen in the same manner. Alright, so they prepared a new cart and put, it's a wooden cart with put two milk cows, basically milk cows, basically the cows were milking, they had calves, they were, the cows were drinking milk of the cows and this, these, cow, these cows were never yoked before, that means they were not cows that would have been, take, take, has ever taken a cart ever, never ridden a cart before, alright, so they were, it was the, car, the yoke itself was a new, and a new experience to the cows, on top of that they had calves, Alright, who are drinking from them milk. And so they took the ark of God and placed it on the cart. And in the box they, pay, pay, they put these five tumors, golden tumors. And it's very weird, right? So just imagine to make a gold image of the tumors that you have in a body. Alright, so they take these tumors and they make a golden image of that. They put five of that because there were five lots, five cities. So they took five tumors, put that, five mice, uh, golden images, put that in the box. And they placed it beside the, beside the ark. And they said, let it go, we'll watch it. I, I, the condition is, it has to go straight. If it goes straight to the Lord, uh, to, to, to Beth Shemesh, if it goes into that land, that means God has actually caused this to happen upon us. And if it doesn't go straight, that means, you know, it is just a coincidence, all these things are happening. But if it, if these, this card goes straight, if the cows go straight there, that means God was in the, they are, the God of Israel had caused all this problem in our midst. Now, what a surprising about this deal. They are very surprising facts, very interesting facts. First, they were milking cows. They would not leave their cows behind just so easily. They said they would keep the cows separately. So the, as being mothers, naturally they would want, not want to leave the cows, they would want to be there they are with the cows. Because it, uh, they are milking. Second, they are not used to a yoke. They don't know what to do when the yoke is put on them. They don't know what the response is supposed to be. Are they, are they, they have, never, they have never been trained on it. Third, they are, ex, 
the cows were expected to go through that road and just continue going straight without turning left or right now if they are milking cows they would get very hungry and they would want to eat and it's like you have chicken biryani here and you have kebabs here and you're saying don't look at the kebabs and chicken biryani just walk straight so you have green pastures on both the sides and these cows are not supposed to go and eat that grass but straight walk straight till they reach their destination so what the philistines were really asking was a miracle to happen i don't think they would have even thought the cows will take one step further so they were watching what the cows what the cows will do will put this challenge let see if the god of israel acts and surely the god of israel acted the cows not only walked and basically were lowing all the way they were crying all the way mo 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 what are you doing to me kind of thing but they were just they just kept walking straight they walked there where did they stop it's not that they continued walking then you had to stop right in israel territory right at bet shamas at the field they saw the israelites i mean god made god made them stop obviously but when they when they just stopped there this is not coincidence and while the philistines are watching the lords of the philistines are watching they said this is god we have put such conditions that idly should have never come to pass at all but everything has come to pass and now the cow, the cows are there in their midst they just see that and they walk away they said yes this is god who has caused it in our midst what do the israelites do the israelites see the cow and that was bet shemesh would have been a land where the levites would live so they would not have shortage of priests as such so the levites basically or or the or the people there the men look at the at the ark of the covenant now the ark of the covenant is not covered all right it was in plain sight they see that on the on the on the uh, on the cart and they start rejoicing and they celebrate and then they immediately call the levites and the levites are there the men are there and they basically uh, take the cart rather the levites would would have lifted the ark of the covenant because only the levites were allowed to actually touch the ark of the covenant so they would have taken they would take took it up kept it on a rock a big rock that they set there and they put it uh, the the other box of that images also beside the ark and then they were basically they took the the wood of the a cart and they burnt it and they sacrificed those milk cows and they put it on the uh, and, and they offered it offered it unto god as a, as a burnt offering until now it feels like wow they did such a wonderful thing they were rejoicing and they were did a very wonderful thing but there was something wrong with what they did there is something very wrong with what they did they were levites they should have realized this but they did not realize it you see when in a strict sense of the mosaic law first of all they offered female animals to the lord which was forbidden the cows or milking cows they were female cows obviously they would have should have not offered female cows or female animals to the lord but they sacrificed female animals to the lord that is one the first mistake they did the second mistake they did was they offered a burnt offering to the lord away from the tabernacle they should have taken the ark first placed it in the tabernacle and then offered a burnt offering but they did not do that they assumed that it's okay to do it here they went and did it anyways so they again violated god's command there now i'm not sure whether it made god angry or not it doesn't have a mention there but god got angry about something else which was very specific and it says 70 of the people there were struck dead because they saw into the ark now interestingly god didn't do that with the philistines but he did it with these people they were not supposed to even look at the ark not even touch the ark so as to say but here you go they obviously wanted to check whether whatever went with the ark came back or not so the levites must have opened the uh, the cover to see is the ten commandments inside is the book of the law inside and while they did that the other men standing around who are not levites would have also looked and god said thank you for looking that's your last day so 
So out of excitement, they did something that as children of God, they knew they should not do, but they did it anyways. And God judged them for that. And what is his response? We accept God. You are a holy God. We cannot play around with you. We cannot play around with you. We, we assume too many things. We, we can't assume so many things. We can't live our life based on assumptions. So the response from them was, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? While you are excited thinking the walk is back, but he still is the holy God. He is not, he's not changing his expectations from us. And to whom shall he go up away from us? See, it, it, it talks about how God, his glory really in one sense never departed. He just, he went to show his glory to the Philistines. He said, you all don't respect my glory. Let me teach them a lesson and show them my glory and then come back to you. And here is the Ark of the Covenant back, a sign that God is, is come back to us without anybody's help. He did it all by himself. If God has to do anything and his enemy is before him, he can do anything by himself. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help. And this proved it. The Ark of the came, just as it was taken away, it came like that only. You see, we again notice God dealt with the Israelites more strictly than he dealt with the Philistines. God did this because the, he, because, the, with this, because the Israelites had the law. The Israelites knew what was and what was not permissible. The Philistines did not. So when God deals with people, he deals with the knowledge that is based on the knowledge that the person has. Or has been given or has been revealed. To the level the Philistines, the knowledge revealed to the Philistines, they, God dealt with them in that way. To the level that was, it was given to the Israelites, He dealt with the Israelites in that way. You know you are not supposed to look into me, you know into the ark, you know you are not supposed to touch. Why did you do it? You think I am going to lay aside my holiness for your joy and for your excitement? No! You have to change your attitude towards me. For the men of Beth Shemesh, the holy, holiness of God is a problem. So what did they do? They called men from Kiryata, Kiryat Jeriam. It's almost like they believe like uh, they behave like the Philistines, huh? didn't they? From one place to another, uh, Ark, Sattar, people are dead, 70 people dead, not in this place. Somebody else take the Ark from us. We can't deal with the holiness of God. And so they decide to take the send the ark to Kiryat Jerim and the people of Kiryat Jerim were like, okay, we will take it. Now whether these people here at Shiloh were or Beth Shemesh were against the people or, or for the people, we do not know. Whether they did it out of genuine, uh, they generally wanted to pass the ark to a safe place or whether they were against the, the people of Kiryat Jerim. So teach them a lesson. They said, we do not know. But all we know is now the ark moved from there because they could not deal with the holiness of, Lord, of God. They, instead of them saying, we, we will change ourselves. Levites were in their midst. Instead of saying, we will change ourselves. The Levites are saying, please take away the ark to another place. The priest is saying, I don't want to be responsible for my responsibility. And they send it away to Kiryat Jeremy. And then from there, it remained there for 20 years. And after that, David took it to Jerusalem. But really, when we look at this story, there are few things that I we have to ask ourselves. God being a holy God has expectations. God has set certain expectations in our worship towards Him. Now we don't sacrifice bulls and everything to God today, but we have one sacrifice that has already been made, fulfilled once and for all, the Lord Jesus. He is a sacrifice. 
how much of reverence do we have in our response to that sacrifice? You see, that covenant was a sign with the people of Israel in the Old Testament. This is my covenant. Upon this covenant, upon this covenant, you are my chosen people. Upon this covenant, I bring you into my kingdom. Upon this covenant, I come into relationship with you. And Jesus did that same thing with us now. We don't have the Ark of the Covenant anymore with us. But we have the blood of Jesus. And upon His blood, the new covenant, this covenant, upon His blood which we remember, upon His body which is sacrificed which we remember, Now God looks at us. God's presence comes upon this place. Upon the blood, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. The glory of God descends and comes between the two cherubim. The body and the blood. Now I'm just saying it figuratively, it's not literal. It's coming here and he's saying, this is my covenant I have with you. The covenant I make in my own blood. Based on this covenant, you come into a relationship with me. That is Jesus. Based on this covenant, you come into a relationship with God the Father. Based on this covenant, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. Based on this covenant, you who were not once a chosen people are now a chosen people. You who were not once children of God are now children of God. Based on this covenant. The body that was broken, the blood that was shed, the ultimate sacrifice, the only sacrifice, the final sacrifice. And we didn't offer Him. We didn't offer that sacrifice. He offered Himself up for us. In all holiness. He Himself was the high priest who made the offering. He Himself was the sacrifice who became the offering. So that He could make a way for you and for me to come into a relationship with His Father and with Him. The perfect Lamb, the spotless Lamb, the slain, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. It's because of this sacrifice, it's because of this High Priest, Today we have a new covenant. We come into the presence of God by a new and living covenant by the living blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. We are not like 70 who will be struck down anymore. We are not like those who cannot come and touch the ark anymore. Who cannot look into the ark. No, he comes and says, This is my covenant. He's saying, eat of it. Drink of my blood. He's saying, be one with me. Be one with me. Don't stand outside. Now the holy place is you. The most holy place is you. The covenant that you drink, you're basically saying, the God covenant is Jesus Christ and what the the sacrifice of what Jesus has done that is what God has done for us now I can come to a relationship with him I can come with boldness into the most holy place because I am already there through the blood of Jesus it's by his grace by his death by His resurrection that He gives us life and life eternal 
And my question to us today is as we partake in, in the Lord's Supper. And we remember how God dealt with the Israelites and how he dealt with false worship coming and how he dealt with when people, priests and con the congregation came before God without holiness in their mind, without reverence in their hearts, without worship in their hearts. He dealt with them strongly because he knew, he wanted them to get the, get the right understanding. You cannot fool with the Holy God. And now that Holy God who was there has come and died for you. How much more can he prove himself to you? What more do you want him to do for you? And that's why the book of Hebrews it says, and now if you basically decline that sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, if you decline that, what offering is left for you? None. And Paul echoes that as well, right? What does he say? When you go look at the book of Corinthians, when we look at the scripture verses about the Lord's Supper, he says in verse 27, the chapter, the chapter 11, verse 27, he says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. You see the terms and conditions really don't change. He still expects you to come with reverence and even more reverence because now the Son of God Himself is the sacrifice for you and for me. And He's saying, don't fool around when you partake with the, with the, with the body and blood of Jesus. Don't fool around it. It's something to be revered with. It, you come with holiness, with reverence in your hearts. With true worship in your hearts. He says, let a person examine himself. Then, and so eat, the, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. For if we have judged ourselves truly, we will not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we, are, we may not be condemned along with the world. Today as we partake in the Lord's Supper, we come to God not on base of the old covenant but a new covenant. And his new covenant basically says, Jeremiah 31. Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it upon their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I will forgive them their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Look at what it says. I will put my law in their hearts. I will put their law within them. I will write it on the tablets of their heart. Now the ark was a container for the law of God. Now what is the container for the law of God? Our hearts. That's what it says. It's not like the old. Now the new has come. Now the ark, the, my, my commandment will not, will not be in the ark, the covenant. It will, the ark, the covenant is now the ark is your hearts, your very hearts. You and my hearts is where the law is supposed to now reside. The ten commandments is supposed to live here in my heart and yours. Now when we partake, will we have joy or will we have sorrow? Will we rejoice or we will mourn? Church, I want you to open up your eyes and may God open up our hearts to see what God has done. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and care and be careful to observe my ordinances as we partake. Remember what God has done. Thank God for what He has done. And come with reverence. Offering holy hands and, and a pure heart. Before God. Thanking Him. That He does not deal with us like before. But He deals with differently. He, he changes us.
He prepares us, He molds us and makes us what we are supposed to be so that we can come in a worthy manner before Him and we come by the grace of God, we come by the blood of Jesus. Amen.